All right, guys, in the last session. Hold your horses, mister. Um, okay, why exactly am I holding my horses? Well, there's a new tool I want to show you. Personally, I think it's incredible. Basically, you just upload the audio from your previous session, and it generates you a recap filled with all the most important parts, complete with music and the narrator of your choice. For real? That's like super handy. Oh, yeah. And it's called Scribe. And the genius behind it is a solo developer. Damn, I bet he's even smarter than you, Saxy. Well, let's not make assumptions. It's not an assumption, it's straight facts. No, but it absolutely- Well, let's hear it, man. Really, Joe? Okay, I've got it right here. Last session, you all successfully leveled up to level eight and made critical choices regarding your character's development. Ra chose the tough feat to significantly increase his hit points, whilst Saxy opted for a plus two intelligence boost, enhancing their mental capabilities. The decision to go with Gift of the Gem Dragon provided a unique reaction tactic for Celestia, and as for Tronald, he selected a feat named Cartomancer, adding a strategic depth to his spellcasting abilities. You sought out Asmo in Waterdeep for assistance and found him sunbathing on the roof of his shop. After convincing him of your true identity as Lord Tanavir, Asmo connected you with his boss Asmo Prime via a magical device. During this conversation, you proposed a plan to infiltrate Solaris by mingling with the nobles set to travel on the airships, hoping to blend in as mid-level aristocrats and their entourage. With this plan in motion, you acquired a ring of self-seeming from Asmo to aid in disguising Tronald, addressing the issue of needing a more permanent solution for a disguise. In exchange for diamonds necessary for spell components, you traded a varied collection of gems and jewelry. Concern for the safety of Lila and Bryn was raised, and Asmo reluctantly agreed to keep an eye on them within Waterdeep. This arrangement reaffirmed the network of support you have started to build in your journey. Might, after feeling unwell, experienced a disturbing vision upon the rooftop involving a mysterious pillar and a sinister mirror. Through the mirror, a voice tempted him with power and purpose, questioning his worth and challenging his desires. The session ended with this ominous offer hanging in the balance, leaving you to ponder the implications and the price of the power it promised. This is where we left off, ready to embark on your cunning plan to gain passage to Solaris, while also grappling with the personal demons and external threats that confront you. Right. Okay, I'll admit it, that's dope. You're damn right it is. What about longer sessions though? Like four hours long, filled with random talk? It's called artificial intelligence, buddy. I don't know what that is. It knows what to pick and what to discard. As for longer sessions, the upload limit is 500 megabits. I don't know how much that is. What do you say, Saxy? That's more than enough for audio. You could easily fit a 12 hour session in there if you're using a good sample type. Yeah, it's good. But I don't think artificial intelligence could ever fully replace me. I mean, there were one or two things in there that I'd have said differently. That's the neat part. You get a transcript of what it's created and can edit it as you see fit before finalizing the audio generation. Well, I'm sold. Where can I find this? I'm going to use it from now on. It's called Scribe, and you can find it at scribe.ca. That's going to be super handy, especially when you have players like Might who zone out every five minutes. Huh? Sorry, did you say something? I wasn't paying attention. Bless your heart. Sweet. I'll get Jamie to put it in the description for all you fine people at home. All right, Might. As you stand atop this impossibly tall pillar, the world around you swallowed by a void of endless darkness, the only thing anchoring you to reality is this eerie, cracked mirror and the shadowy figure emerging from it. The weight of its offer hangs in the silence, the words still echoing in your mind. The darkness presses in closer, as if the world itself is waiting, holding its breath for your response. So might, Faced with this creature, this apparition, and the choice it presents, what do you want to do? I try to maintain my balance atop the stone pillar. Then I say, who are you and why have you come to me with such an offer? As you struggle to maintain your balance atop the narrow stone pillar, the creature begins to pull itself further out of the cracked mirror. Its form is ink black and globular, oozing and dripping like some formless slime as it slowly saps itself free from the confines of the glass. The substance seems to ripple and shudder as it emerges, tendrils of shadow clinging to the edges of the mirror before snapping back into its body. Then before your eyes, the creature starts to shift and mold, its features becoming more defined, its shape taking on a horrifying familiarity. With each passing second, it becomes clearer, more distinct until you realize that you are staring at yourself. 
The creature now stands before you, a perfect reflection of your own image, identical in every way. Yet there is something deeply wrong, a twisted darkness that lingers in its eyes. I have no name. I need no name. Names do not grant one power. Not real power. Real power comes from steel, from the edge of a blade driven by unwavering will. You cling to names, to identities, to things that make you feel safe. But those are lies, illusions to keep you weak. I offer you the truth, Might. I offer you strength beyond anything you've ever known. Take my hand, accept the pact, and together we will carve your name into the bones of this world. No one will ever doubt your power again. No one will ever mock you again. This is your moment. Embrace it, or be forever consumed by your own insignificance. Wait, hold up. I'm confused. You're talking all this stuff about power and steel, but you haven't even told me what pact I'm making. Like, what's the deal here? You can't just throw out big words and expect me to jump in, man. I need details. What am I signing up for? We both know, Mike, that no matter what words I weave, your answer will be the same. Acceptance lingers on your tongue, like the taste of inevitability. But if you desire clarity, I shall indulge your curiosity. I offer you strength, Might. The power you crave. The power to rise above the feeble masses who cling to their illusions of safety. In return, you will cast aside the shackles of forgiveness, for you will need no absolution. You will never bow, never kneel before another mortal again. When the threads of fate cross your blade, you will sever them without hesitation, without mercy. You will become a force of will, unstoppable and unyielding. This is the pact, Might. Strength beyond reckoning, in exchange for the cold steel of your resolve. The world will bend to your will, or it will break under the weight of your blade. The choice is yours, but we both know you've already made it. Well, that was a little vague, but I guess that's just your style, huh? All dark and mysterious. But hey, you're not asking for my soul or anything, right? Just some strength, some power, and a little less mercy. Yeah, sure, let's do it. I'm ready. If this is what it takes to get stronger, to never bow to anyone again, then I'm all in. I'll take your power. I'll cut those pesky threads of fate. Let's make this pact and see where it takes us. After all, what's the worst that could happen, right? The creature's dark, twisted smile widens, a sickening grin that stretches far beyond the limits of your own face. Before you can react, it lurches forward, its slimy, inky form bursting into your mouth with a force that nearly chokes you. The taste is bitter and cold, like swallowing pure darkness, and you feel it slithering down your throat, filling your lungs, invading every corner of your being. It's as if the creature is consuming you from the inside out, spreading through your veins like poison. The stone pillar beneath your feet shudders violently, cracks spider webbing across its surface before it shatters completely. You plummet downward, the world around you spinning out of control. The sensation is overwhelming, as though you're falling from the very edge of the stratosphere, the air rushing past you in a deafening roar. The distant ground races toward you, growing larger and larger with terrifying speed. You put your arms out instinctively, a futile attempt to halt your descent, but the force of the fall is unstoppable. Oh shit! Just as the ground seems inevitable, something inside you reacts. The darkness you swallowed surges forth, wrapping around your body like living tendrils of black ooze. The substance moves with a mind of its own, catching the air and slowing your fall, coiling around your limbs, merging with your very flesh. It's as though the darkness itself is preventing your demise, shaping itself into a protective armor that cushions your impact. The world begins to clear, the chaotic rush of wind and noise subsiding into an eerie calm. You find yourself standing upright, the ground beneath you solid once more. Your breath comes in ragged gasps as you look down at your hand. There in your grip is a rapier, its blade still wet and slick with the same black ooze that saved you. The substance begins to harden, solidifying slowly, transforming from formless darkness into a blade of gleaming steel. The rapier feels unnervingly familiar in your hand, as if it was always meant to be yours. 
You're still catching your breath, trying to process what just happened when you hear the creak of a door opening behind you. You turn, and through the haze of lingering darkness, you see Saxy stepping onto the roof. Hey, mate, how's your hot flush doing? Hey, Saxy. Uh, yeah, about that hot flush. It's, it's gone, I think. But, man, something really weird just happened. I was up here, and then this thing... This creature came out of a mirror, yeah, like a creepy crack mirror, and it looked like me, but all twisted and dark. And then it just just lunged at me, and it, it went into me, like straight into my mouth, and I couldn't breathe. And then I was falling, like really falling, and everything was spinning, and I thought I was going to smash into the ground. But then this this black stuff, it wrapped around me and and saved me, and now I've got this rapier, this black ooze rapier and it just turned into steel i have no idea what the hell is going on but i think i might have made some kind of pact or something what the fuck might how do you not know for certain if you made a goddamn pact i don't know saxy it was all so fast well who was the pact with i i don't know saxy he didn't have a name he just said names don't give power or something like that he was all cryptic and spooky, talked a lot about strength and steel and how I'd never have to kneel to anyone again, but he never actually told me who or what he was. I didn't even get a straight answer about the pack, just that it would make me stronger. I think I might have just agreed to something really big, but I honestly have no idea who it was with. You're a fucking idiot, Mike. Why in the nine hells would you make a pact with someone when you don't even know who they are and they didn't even tell you specifically what you were agreeing to? I mean, come on, man. This isn't some casual agreement. What were you thinking? I don't know, man. Once again, you're an absolute idiot. But at least you're an honest idiot. I've got to give you that. I'd half expect any of those other guys to keep it to themselves, try to hide it. But you came right out and told me. So I'll give you that much credit, at least. Why did you do it, though, man? Why put yourself at risk? Uh, I think I think it's because I always feel so weak compared to you guys. You might as well be walking demigods with all the power and strength you have. And then there's me, just a stupid old cat man who doesn't really bring anything to the table. I'm always trying to keep up, but I know I'm just dragging you all down. Whoever or whatever it was could probably sense that and acted on it. They knew exactly where to hit, what buttons to push. But things will be different now, Saxy. You won't have to carry me anymore. I won't be the weak link. I'll make sure of it. I'll prove it to you, to everyone. Things are going to change. You don't have to prove anything to us, Mike. We've never seen you as weak. Hell, we've all had our moments where we felt like we didn't measure up, where we doubted ourselves. But that's the thing. You don't have to be the strongest or the fastest or the most powerful. You're part of this team. And we need you just as much as you need us. You've always brought something to the table, even if you don't see it yourself. You're not just some stupid old cat man. You're might. You're our friend, our brother. And nothing, no pact, no power, nothing can change that. We've got your back no matter what. So don't carry this burden alone. You don't have to be anything more than who you already are. Because who you are is enough. Thanks, Saxy. That, that means a lot. More than you know. So, um, how about a hug to seal the deal? What the hell, man? A hug? Really, Might? You're gonna make this weird now? Come on, we just had a moment here. Let's not ruin it. Come on, Saxy, don't act like you're too cool for a hug. You know you want to? No, I really don't. It's not happening. You're not getting me with that sad kitten look. I don't do hugs, Might. Oh, come on. Just this once. I promise I won't tell anyone. Just one hug for your old buddy, Might. Fine. Fine, you persistent fool. But just this once, all right? Joe, I lean forward and give Might an awkward hug. I grapple onto him and give him a big ol' squeeze. All right, all right, get off me, man, before Rar sees this and wants to join in. God knows I've had enough hugs now for the rest of my life without letting that big green hulk of muscle and attitude want one as well. I let go of him, Joe. That was nice, Saxy. Yeah, huh. Sure. All right, let's head back down to the rest of them. Uh, we've come up with a plan on how we're going to meet Asmo Prime. Sure, and how? I fill him in as we walk down, Joe. All right. You both start walking down the stairs, leaving the rooftop behind. As you descend, Saxy, you quickly fill Might in on the plan you discussed with the group, using one of the smaller airships to reach Asmo Prime and all the nitty gritty bits in between. Oh, you're finally here. Took you long enough. What the hell were you doing up there? Making out or something? Shh. All right, guys, it's time we move on out. 
Is there anything else we need before we get to work? Not that I can think of. We've got the basics covered. And honestly, we'll probably just end up winging a lot of things anyway. That's usually how it goes, right? True. By the way, I'd like to visit the Mythos Citadel again before we start this plan, though, guys. There's a lot of things that I find strange with what's happened recently. It'll mean I need to change myself into Lady Alara again. I'll come with you. I'll just use the new ring of self-seeming to make myself look like a private bodyguard for you. All right, sweet. You two do that. Myself, Might, and Rar can go about finding us the right clothing we're going to need for this job. All right, then. Joe, I kneel down to Lila's level, looking into her eyes. I reach out and gently place a hand on her shoulder, giving it a reassuring squeeze. Stay strong, little one. You've got so much strength in you, more than you know. Keep training. Keep pushing yourself. One day, you'll be stronger than all of us. I'll make sure of that. And remember, no matter what happens, you're never alone. We're all out here fighting for you, fighting for this world, and we'll always have your back. Lila's eyes well up with tears as she listens to you, Rar, but she quickly blinks them away, determination shining through. Without a word, she steps forward and throws her arms around you in a tight, heartfelt hug, burying her face in your chest. After a brief moment, Bryn gently places a hand on Lila's shoulder, guiding her to let go. She looks up at you one last time, giving you a brave smile before turning away. Bryn nods to you in silent gratitude, then takes Lila by the hand. Together, they walk out of the door, their figures gradually fading into the distance as they head off down the road, disappearing into the soft light of the morning. Fuck, I'm gonna miss that kid. You'll see her again, you big softy, just like you promised. Hey, Asmo, quick question. So we're gonna need to look the part if we're gonna pull this off, right? Where do you suggest we go to get some fine threads? I'm talking top tier, real fancy stuff. Something that'll make Saxy and Celestia blend in with the upper crust, you know? We can't just walk in there looking like we crawled out of a goblin outhouse. We need to look sharp, like we belong, especially them too. Any recommendations? There's only one place in Waterdeep that can get you the kind of threads you need. The Silken Veil. It's the go-to spot for the nobles and anyone else looking to make a statement. They've got everything from the finest silks to enchanted fabrics that shimmer just right under the ballroom lights. The place is run by Madame Alara LaSalle. She's a bit eccentric, but she's got an eye for detail like no other. She'll size you up in seconds and know exactly what you need to fit in. Oh God, another Alara? How common is that name? I mean, we've only met two of them. Names are just like that, man. No matter how unique you think your name is, there will always be someone somewhere called the same. What a load of Coswellop. I can tell you this right now, there's only one Tronald. Hmm. We will have to see about that. So where can we find this, Madame LaSalle? You'll want to head over to the Castle Ward. It's where all the bigwigs and fancy folks tend to hang out. Once you're there, keep an eye out for a shop with large, ornate windows draped in the finest fabrics you've ever seen. There's a silver sign above the door that reads, The Silken Veil. You can't miss it. That's where you'll find Madame LaSalle. Great. Thanks for that, Asmo. Right. Well, let's split up then, guys. We can meet up just outside the airship drop-off bays when we're finished. All right then, guys. So who's going first? It, you two go if you want. I'm intrigued to know what you're wanting to search for. All right, sweet. Joe, I'm going to activate the ring, transforming myself into a young-looking wizard with as little physical structure changes as possible. I don't want to pass through something if I touch it. As you activate the ring, Tronald, you feel a subtle shift in your appearance. Your hair darkens to a sleek black, and your features smooth out, giving you the appearance of a young, ambitious wizard. The changes are minor, just enough to alter your look without compromising your physical structure, ensuring you won't pass through anything if you touch it. Your robes shimmer slightly, taking on a more refined, arcane appearance that fits the part perfectly. Once the transformation is finished, you head on out with Celestia. The streets of Waterdeep are starting to get busier the further you go in, and it's not long before you find yourself at the Mythos Citadel. Standing out front, you see a man with golden black skin, his smile widening as he spots you. His white teeth gleam in the sunlight, a stark contrast to his dark complexion. You immediately recognize him as Olarun, a familiar face from Celestia his past dealings. Hey there, Olarun. How goes the search for knowledge? Why, hello there, young seeker. The search for knowledge has been fruitful as always. The world is rich with secrets and I've been busy uncovering them one by one. He glances over at you, Tronald, his sharp eyes taking in your transformed figure with a smile. Ah, uh, I see. Moving up in the world now, are we? 
a private wizard guard to accompany you on your journeys? You must be making quite the impression in certain circles. But tell me, what brings you to the Mythos Citadel this fine day? Well, I guess you could call it that, Oleron. A little extra protection never hurts. I'm just here to see if I can pick up a thing or two, maybe expand my horizons, you know how it is. But Oleron, I just realized I forgot to ask you something. I know I have a membership here, but what about my private guard? Would he need a separate membership as well? Or would it be acceptable for him to join me as my escort? He won't be doing any studying or taking up resources, just keeping an eye out, making sure I'm safe. I'd hate to trouble you with extra paperwork or formalities, but you know how things are these days. Give me a persuasion check, Celestia. For fuck's sake, man. Oh, that's a seven total, Joe. Oleron listens to your request, his keen eyes studying you closely as you speak. You can sense that your words haven't quite had the impact you hoped for, the weight of your request not swaying him as much as you intended. Ah, dear Seeker, there is no need to worry yourself with such concerns. The Mythos Citadel is not just any place of learning, it is a fortress of knowledge, protected by wards and guardians far beyond the comprehension of most. The very walls pulse with ancient magic, and the air hums with the presence of centuries-old wisdom. Within these halls, you will be as safe as one could be, second only to the Emperor's court itself. Your private guard will find no need to unleash his magic here, for there are forces in this citadel that watch over all who enter. Rest easy, young seeker. Your safety is assured. It can't be that bloody well protected. You've already basically broke in once. I say that in my head, Joe. Huh, all right, I was gonna say. Well, can we just pay for him to have access? I just feel more comfortable with him around. He's never really left my sight since he was assigned to me. Of course, young seeker. I understand the value of trusted company, especially one who has been by your side so faithfully. If it puts your mind at ease, then arrangements can certainly be made. Will this be for access to the Golden Archives? If so, the offering remains the same. 50 gold pieces per month. This will grant your guard the same privileges as any scholar within these walls, ensuring that he may accompany you wherever your studies take you within the Citadel. That is, aside from the Platinum Sanctum. Yeah, give me access to the Golden Archives. Here's 50 gold pieces. Okay, and under what name shall this registry be made? My name is Jeff. Wow. Ah, Jeff. What a glorious name for a seeker. Please take this token as a symbol of your rights to study amongst the Golden Archives. Thanks, Oleran. Joe, I take the token, then turn to Celestia in an obedient manner. Whenever you're ready, milady. Excellent. Come, Jeff. We have work to do. With the arrangements made, you both step toward the grand entrance of the Mythos Citadel. As the doors open silently before you, the vast and ornate interior of the Citadel comes into view. High arched ceilings stretch above, adorned with intricate carvings and golden inlays that catch the light of the magically illuminated sconces. Tronald, you follow Celestia's lead as she confidently navigates the winding corridors and ascends the towering stairwells. Your footsteps echo softly against the polished stone floors. As you go deeper, the atmosphere shifts. What begins as an open and welcoming space becomes more guarded, more sacred. You climb higher and higher, passing by scholars engrossed in their studies and guards who nod respectfully as you pass. Eventually, Celestia, you reach a familiar point a threshold you've encountered before. Ahead lies the path to the Platinum Sanctum, the most restricted area within the Citadel. You know that just beyond this point, the guards of the Platinum Sanctum stand vigilant, protecting the entry to the most powerful and secretive tomes and artifacts known to this world. What would you like to do? All right, Tronald, this is where I'm going to have to change. We should get past the guards easily enough, but in case it becomes an issue, I'm glad I've got you here for your, how shall we put it, ability to alter fate. Yeah, I've got you, girl. Just lead the way, and I'll work my magic behind the scenes when and if necessary. All right, Joe. I begin transforming my body into that of Lady Alara. Uh, okay. As you begin the transformation, Celestia, your body shifts and molds, the familiar magic of your changeling nature taking hold. Your skin tingles as it changes, smoothing out and lightening to match the ethereal pallor of Lady Alara. Your hair darkens, the color deepening into a rich jet black, cascading down your shoulders in silken waves. 
As the transformation continues, your eyes sharpen, taking on that striking icy blue hue that seems to pierce the very soul of anyone who meets your gaze. The process is fluid and natural, and when it's finally complete, you stand there, a perfect replica of Lady Alara, with all the poise and presence that commands respect, ensuring that anyone who sees you will believe without a doubt that they are in the presence of the real Lady Alara. I do a little twirl on the spot. How do I look, Tronald? Honestly, absolutely terrifying. Perfect. All right, Joe, I make my way up the last few steps and around the corner, my head held high, not even paying the guards any attention. I approach the door and say, open up now, I have business to conduct. Give me either a persuasion or an intimidation check. That's a 15 intimidation, Joe. The guards exchange uneasy glances, clearly intimidated by your presence. One of them, a bit braver than the others, steps forward hesitantly. Oh, of course, my lady. But we are still required to see your platinum token. Just a formality. It's standard protocol, even for council members. Please forgive the inconvenience. Joe, I pull out my deck of cards and they begin to glow with a fiery energy that pulses ominously in the dim light. I step forward, towering over the guards, my voice a low growl that reverberates through the corridor. Did you not just hear what Lady Alara said? We have urgent business with the Emperor himself. Do you think for one second that a councilwoman of her stature has to concern herself with carrying around your pathetic little tokens? Are you really so foolish as to delay her with such trivial nonsense? The fiery energy from the cards intensifies, casting shadows across the walls. I let the silence hang for a moment, letting the weight of the threat settle in before continuing. Open this door, right this instant, or I swear on all the gods, I will personally see to it that your heads are sent on the next airship back to Solaris. And when they arrive, they will be spiked onto the castle walls as a reminder of what happens to those who dare stand in Lady Alara's way. Do you understand me? Holy shit. All right, give me an intimidation check with advantage. That's a natural 19 for a 19 total. Really, wasn't that a bit risky, dude, if you don't have any bonuses? Not really, I had a high roll secured if need be. The guard's eyes widen in terror. Beads of sweat form on his forehead and his hands begin to shake uncontrollably as your words sink in. P please, my lord, I'm just following protocol. I, I didn't mean to offend, I swear. It's just that the rules say... The other guard, sensing the situation spiraling out of control, quickly steps forward and tries to defuse the situation. J just open the door for them, Tyrone. We know who she is. It's Lady Alara. The tokens, they're really just for people we aren't so familiar with. We don't want any trouble, especially not with the Emperor's Council. We don't need to follow every single rule to the letter when it's someone like her. Just open the door. Man, but it's protocol, Rashid. You think the Citadel is gonna care about our justification if something goes wrong? Bro, I don't care about protocol right now. We're talking about Lady Alara. You know, one of the most powerful people in the Empire. Do you really think she's carrying around some stupid token like the rest of us common folk? Just open the damn door, right bloody now, man. Rashid gestures wildly at the door, clearly exasperated with his partner's hesitation. I get that. But if we don't follow protocol and something goes wrong, it's our asses on the line. You know how it is. No exceptions, they said. What if this ain't really her? What if it's some kind of trick or something? Then what, huh? Tyrone, my brother, think about it. If this really is Lady Alara, do you want to be the one standing in her way? And if it's not, do you honestly believe some imposter would have the guts to try this? Either way, we're in a lose-lose situation if we don't let her through. Just open the damn door, man. We can't afford to get this wrong, especially with someone of her rank. Let's not make this any harder on ourselves than it already is. Finally, Tyrone gives in. I'd fine, fine. But if anything happens, it's on you, Rashid. Yeah, yeah, whatever, man. We'll talk about this later when we're not pissing off the Emperor's right-hand woman. The door swings open as Tyrone steps aside, trying his best to avoid making eye contact with you or Lady Alara, while Rashid lets out a small sigh of relief. In we go then, Joe. As you begin to walk in, the heavy doors of the Platinum Sanctum glide open with a soft, almost reverent whisper. It's then Rashid once again speaks up. May your quest for knowledge be fruitful for both the Emperor and the Crimson Council. Good luck, and may the gods guide your path. I ignore him, in true Lady Alara fashion. As you step into the Platinum Sanctum Celestia, 
The familiar grandeur of the place overwhelms you like an old, revered memory. The towering shelves filled with countless tomes rise up to meet the celestial dome overhead, just as they did in your previous visit. But what strikes you again as it did before is the stillness, the absence of assisting hands, the lack of any scholars or attendants around. In this sanctum, even the Citadel's most trusted staff are denied entry. Damn, this place is crazy. How do we go about getting books down then? And what is it exactly that you want to find out? Well, all we have to do is think of the topic that we want to research and the most relevant book will come to us. As for what I want to find out, well, I'm interested specifically in why exactly Vizuriel attacked White Willow out of everywhere. So I think I'll start out on the histories of White Willow. Oh, damn. That's a good shout. I think I also want to research something whilst we're here. The Akashic Records. Vizuriel mentioned them to me some time back. I don't know if he was just being elusive or if there was something material about him bringing up the topic. Damn, indeed. Right, guys. I'm going to call that there for tonight. What you're about to delve into could be fairly interesting, so I'd rather not break off in the middle of it. Boo! That's fair enough, man. See you later, guys.